Hello, today we're going to talk about Ephesians. We've been working through Paul's letters and uh, probably have watched the one on Galatians, but now let's take some time and look at Paul's letter known as uh, the letter to uh, the church in Ephesus. Ephesus was a massive, major, critically important first century city. I would argue it's one of the top five major cities of the first century and really top five of the Bible um, or of the New Testament at least. You think about how important Jerusalem is when it comes to the Gospels. Of course, you have Rome, the capital city. We've mentioned Corinth and Ephesus. Ephesus is one of the most important and critically uh, valuable cities, and we'll talk a little bit about it. Here's a little video from a library database called uh, Films on Demand. If you want to check that out, you can follow that link and um, learn a little bit more about the city of Ephesus. So Ephesus was a leading commercial center in the region known as Asia Minor. Today, if you look at a map and you were looking for Asia Minor, you wouldn't find it, but you would find the country of Turkey. And um, the reason why I highlight that is when Paul would travel around the world, uh, when he goes to Corinth, when he goes to Thessalonica, he's going to the kind of commercial centers, major cities, capital cities of each of the regions. He's going where the people are. Ephesus would have been very wealthy. Uh, for example, it had an amphitheater that sits as many as Rupp Arena does today. Rupp Arena, of course, being the um, place where the University of Kentucky's basketball team plays. And part of this was the city was so new. It had a massive earthquake um, during the life of Jesus. Of course, Jesus never traveled outside Israel, so he wouldn't have uh, been, a, you know, kind of aware of any of that. But what we find out is that um, there were major construction projects going on um, during uh, the time of Paul. So this place would have been growing. And, and of course, when we think about Paul's individual letters, where do we start first? We always step back, take that 30,000 foot view, and we go back to the book of Acts, right? Because Acts tells us the overall story of Paul's life. And now we are going to look at Acts chapter 19. So let's go there. Pull out your Bible. Look at Acts 19. In Acts 19, we hear the story of Paul in the city of Ephesus to the point that as Paul is preaching this message of Jesus and how Jesus is Lord of all and how all these other gods are um, false gods, pick this up in Acts chapter 19, verse 8. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Now, we know that's Paul's norm, come into a city, go into the synagogue, begin to preach and teach there. Uh, verse 9, but some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him, had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannius. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and the Greeks who live in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. So a new thing we find out also that through Paul, there were miracles happening. People were being made well. Demons were being cast out. But also in that little um, set of scriptures that I read, we find out that Paul spent over two years in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus is one of the largest investments of time that Paul's ever made. And uh, we go down and let's find out. Um, let's look at verse 23. So about this time, there arose a great disturbance among the people of the way. That's, that's talking about Christians. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. So let's talk about this, Artemis. Um, this would have been the temple of Artemis. Uh, and Artemis is one of the key um, goddesses. Let's find out here. Oh, there is the goddess Artemis, uh, one of the key goddesses of first century. And she would have been worshipped 
honored, adored in the city of Ephesus in her temple. So here's Artemis. And let's come back here and look at the temple. Uh, this is what we believe the temple would have looked like today. The, the modern or the ancient ruins still stand, but it would probably have been like this. So it was one of the wonders of the world. It would have been spectacular, but also it's this amazing structure where people would come from around the world, particularly devotees of Artemis would come. Uh, you can see Ar Artemis on the top um, in the center of the um, almost of the roof of the building there. But this would have been a huge place of commerce, how this place would have made so much money for the city. So Paul's going to have an encounter with one of the men who is a silversmith, who he makes idols, uh, small statues of the goddess Artemis, probably sells them right outside the, the temple there. So let's come back and look at verse 25, Acts 19.25. Paul called them the... Uh, uh, Demetrius, the silversmith, called them together along with the workers in related trades. And he said, you know, my friends, we receive a good income from this business. And you see in here now, this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus, and particularly the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also the temple of the great goddess, goddess Artemis, will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. So you see here, there is now a um, war of the gods. Who's greater? The god that Paul proclaims, Yahweh of the Hebrew Bible, the one who has taken flesh, become Jesus. Is this god lord over all, or is Artemis the one who should be worshipped? And particularly, um, the idea that Artemis is making us money, right? So even if we don't believe in this, because we know we make the idols with our human hands, uh, she's still making us money. So verse 28, when the crowd heard this, they were furious. They began to shout, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in uproar, and the people seized Gaius, Archelaus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed to the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before this crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent a message begging for him not to go into this theater. So we see a very similar thing that happened in Thessalonica. Remember, the crowd gets a huge uproar. The whole city is in a panic. They're claiming that Paul is proclaiming an, another king outside of Caesar, claiming that these Christians are the ones who are turning the world upside down. Here now in Ephesus, he is challenged how they've made money, and um, and now he's his companions have been taken. They're in this theater. This has a feel of kind of like what happened to Stephen in Acts chapter six when Stephen was was drugged, or six and seven when Stephen was drugged to the outside the city and he was stoned. Um, this has this feel of a violent crowd beginning to happen, and of course Paul is not. All his friends are saying you cannot get in this crowd. They are going to tear you limb for limb. And um, verse 34, when they realized that Paul was a Jew, they shouted in unison for about two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So you see now they have this ethnic discrimination of Paul because he's Jewish. And what that means is Jews were the only people of the first century who believed that God was invisible and that God was um, did, and that God did not want any kind of idols, images, statues, pictures, nothing like that. So for many people, they thought the Jews were kind of like an atheist, right? And uh, there was a lot of hatred towards Jews, which we still see today, right? And so they, they hear this, they begin to, you know, freak out so much. And um, to the point um, that the officials have to intervene and save Paul's life. So I highlight to say all this, that Ephesus uh, during Paul's time was a, was a very dynamic, powerful, huge center of commerce, but particularly the goddess Artemis and Paul in his message is really challenging um, this goddess. So here is the amphitheater I mentioned, 25,000 strong. 
beautiful amphitheater which still exists today. You can see today if you go to Turkey. Um, here is modern day Ephesus now. Some of the ancient homes that still stand. Um, in Ephesus, this is the oldest um, icon picture we have of St. Paul in the world. Uh, th they think it dates to about the second century. And you see his two fingers being held up. Um, he's not calling for the right hander from the bullpen. He is acknowledging that, that the picture is acknowledging that he is a teacher. Okay. And let's talk about this letter, um, Ephesians, right? Ephesians is probably Paul's most general letter because as we look at Ephesians chapter one, Ephesians chapter one, um, Verse 1 says this, so Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. The interesting thing is the earliest manuscripts we have, uh, they don't have the term in Ephesus. It just reads to God's holy people, the faithful in Christ Jesus. So this could have been operating as a general letter, yet um, later manuscripts have Ephesus attached. We don't know why. Um, why that is. We don't know which one is the most accurate, yet uh, we do know that this was Paul's kind of most high-end, uh, he uses the fanciest Greek here, and um, what he's trying to do is he's trying to unite Jews and Gentiles. He's trying to lead people away from false worship, particularly sorcery, and he's trying to get them to form into one body of people, the church. Now, so far in, in, in our lectures, we really haven't talked about the church, uh, because so often when I mention the word church, if you're like me, you think of some building, you know, the Baptist church, the, you know, Presbyterian, Methodist, Pentecostals, you know, Church of Christ, you think about something like that, you think of a building, a small group of people, but when Paul is using the term ecclesia, right, for the church, ecclesia is the Greek word, it literally means called out gathering. It could have also been a, a gathering of people for politics, kind of a political convention. But Paul is going to use the book of Ephesians, and he's going to spend his most intense, detailed time talking about this, kind of what it is to be the church. Um, and we talk, we, we talk about the study of this. It's called ecclesiology, the study of what is the church. So I think it's very important for us to look at the Bible and to see what the Bible has to say about what the church is, rather than looking at the modern expressions we have right now. Some are really, really beautiful and wonderful. Um, churches that are down at the southern border taking care of refugees. Churches who are in the inner city taking care of the hungry. Uh, churches today who are opening up their space and affirming those of various sexualities. Um, churches who are on the front lines of, of battling racism churches who have education programs for kids and programs for single moms. These things are beautiful. We also know that there are some really, really bad examples of churches that uh, become, you know, havens for sexual abusers and hate groups and, you know, Christian nationalists and this kind of nonsense and sin. Yet, rather than looking at maybe the expressions we've seen in our modern world that are painful, let's come back to the Bible and say, what does the Bible say about what the church should be? And then therefore our vision can grow out of that. So um, Paul opens up and in this first chapter is really one long sentence, really. Um, and Paul opens up with this beautiful idea of a praising of God. And this feels like a typical Jewish blessing. Um, that Christ has provided for us, that we have been predestined, we've been chosen from the beginning, that we've been adopted into the family of God. We were once orphans and now we're brought in. We have been redeemed. We were once uh, slaves to sin, but now we've been set free. We've been purchased. Uh, once we were guilty, now we're forgiven. Uh, once we were without knowledge, but now our eyes have been opened and God has sent us God's Holy Spirit to, to, to seal the promise. And now we have that promise so that we can look forward to a beautiful inheritance. And in, let's look at Ephesians chapter one and we'll just jump in uh, verse 18, right? Actually verse 15, let's hear about Paul's prayer. So Ephesians 1, 15, 
For this reason, ever since I've heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep in here. Now we're going to find out what's the substance. What is he praying for with these believers? Verse 17, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may the hope you may know the hope to which he has called you, <clears throat> the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him in his right hand in the heavenly realms. So praying for them to know the love of God, to know the power of God, to know the inclusion of God, and... Um, this beautiful truth at Paul. Now, as Paul goes along, let's talk about what his vision of the church is. And with that, we realize that Paul, rather than having just one line about the church is, throughout the letter, he talks about it. The first thing he says, he says that the church is Christ's body. So Christ is in heaven. And how does Christ operate in the world. Now, Christ sends his spirit, but who does the work, right? That's the church. The role of the church is do, to do the work of Jesus. The Christ has conquered all things for the church. And here's the key. Paul believes the church should be the symbol of what unification looks like. So there should be high levels of diversity, but not only, as soon as I say diversity, you think you might think black, white, um, Latino, Caucasian, Latinx, right? Um, but I'm thinking disabled, abled also. PhDs, no GEDs. Families who vacation at Disney in Europe and families who can't pay their electric bill. People who are loving Donald Trump and people who are as liberal as it gets, people who hold American passports and people who are non-American passport holders. The church should be a collection of the various peoples on earth and it should be unified because the church now operates as the temple of God where God's spirit resides. No longer is it a building but it's a gathering of people. This is where God dwells. This is also, the church is God's chosen instrument to show God's wisdom in the world. Particularly, God is calling the church to speak to the rulers, the authorities, and the powers of the day. Uh, rather than, and I think this is really important to highlight, rather than the church to be, um, you know, kind of in bed with one political um, person, Right. You know, like loving Trump, loving Biden, loving, you know, whatever local politician it is. The church should stay out of um, supporting individual candidates and the church should challenge every politician to do what they're called to do. Taking care of the poor, the widow, uh, the stranger, the person in prison. Paul also says uh, the church is to be a family, to bring God glory. And the, the role of the church is to equip the saints to do the work of ministry, um, to build one another up in love, to speak the truth in love. Now, Paul argues that the tension with this is that there is a spiritual battle. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, all people are dead in their sins. They are held captive by Satan, who is the ruler of this world. And that when they're held captive by Satan, they are giving themselves away to the desires and the lusts of the flesh. But Christ has stepped in. Christ has died for everybody. And Christ is seeking to um, make everyone whole, to save them. And this is where we pick up. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For it's by God's grace that you've been saved. This comes through faith. This is not from yourselves. This is the gift of God, not by your works so that you can boast. 
For we are all God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good, to do good works, which have been prepared in advance for us to do. So what Paul says is that we are held captive by Satan. We've been lost in our sins, and there's no way for us to get out of this dilemma. God steps in. Now, God is not obligated. God did not have to, but out of God's creative love, God is longing and moves to release us. This is what's called God's grace, when God did not have to, but God longed to do. So God moves to rescue us, and we participate in this rescuing by faith. We trust in what Christ has done. Then, as we are in Christ, what happens is we start to do good works. Now, those works aren't the ones that saves us. We can't do enough works to earn approval of God because we already have the approval of God. So previously, we were doing the works of Satan, following the way of our flesh. But now, in Christ, we are doing all these wonderful good works that God has prepared from the beginning of time for us. Therefore, one of the, the signs of this power is that uh, both Jews and Gentiles have been brought together. Before they were, the Gentiles were foreigners to God's promise. They were separated. But through the death of Jesus on the cross, the barriers, the walls of hostility have been taken down. And uh, God is seeking now to bring peace. And we find this. Um, listen to Ephesians 2, verses 14 through 18. Ephesians 2, 14 through 18. For he himself meaning Jesus, he is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in his body, in one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, which he has put to death their hostilities. He came to preach peace to, who, to those who were far away and peace to those who were near. Or through him, we both have access to the spirit. So Christ came to bring peace. Therefore, as Paul goes along in Ephesians, he gets into a really detailed conversation about what does this new life of Christ look like? Now, one of the things that we did not mention, I can't believe I forgot this. Ephesians is one of Paul's prison letters. Of the 13 letters Paul wrote, there are four that he wrote in prison, which is um, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. These four letters Paul wrote in prison, and it really changes the way that we hear his, his work. So let's look at Ephesians 4, verse 1. Remember, the context is Paul in prison. So let's look at Ephesians 4, verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received, right? So here he is, he's in prison, and now he's saying, for you, you must live a life that's worthy of this call as a, as a prisoner, right? I'm asking, I'm begging you. So what does it mean? Paul says, to live this life, we are to be gentle and humble, patient, bearing with one another with love, um, and that we are to make every possible effort to live in peace become one body who has been given one spirit, who serves one Lord, who celebrates one faith. We are brought into this tradition through one baptism, and we celebrate the one God. So we no longer have this old mindset, which is a hardness of heart, greedy, lustful, but now we are to be imitators of God. So pick this up. Let's look at Ephesians 5, verse 1. Ephesians 5, verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering, right? So this idea is that we were to live in a beautiful way. Um, so with that, we hear some very practical advice. Let's go back, look at Ephesians 4, verse 29. Ephesians 4, 29. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, so that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. 
be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. This powerful um, truth, right? This powerful truth of uh, forgiving one another, being kind and compassionate to one another. Now, in Ephesians, the hot take of the text is Paul's advice on marriage. So today, there are three things that uh, when people talk about St. Paul, when you look at you know, overall scholarship, there are three really, really painful, tense teachings or points in Paul's teachings. The first one is the idea of slavery. Uh, Paul does not come straight out and say, everyone eliminates slavery. In some places, he tells slaves to be obedient and to be good slaves, to be obedient to their masters. We read that today and we think, what? Are you kidding me? This is horrific. And in many ways, it is. Slavery is always horrific. Now, when we read texts inside the first century context, can we look at Paul's advice and to say, this was the best case scenario for a system that was not going to do away with slavery? Is the you know, was this the best advice that Paul could give to a slave? I mean, that's one way to, to think about it, but am I simply trying to justify it? So that's a pain point, Paul's view of slavery. Second one is at times how Paul speaks about women. Uh, recently in one of the lectures we, you and I talked about in the pastoral letters, First and Second Timothy and Titus, Paul tells women to learn in submission and silence and have no authority over a man. That is hugely painful. Was that something very specific to the congregation that Paul's writing to? Because in other places he seems to be very pro-woman. Or is this a misogynistic, male-dominated, patriarchal text? Second pain point. The third one is how Paul looks at marriage. Let's go there. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, um, and let's start with verse 21, Ephesians 5, 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Now, when I say this, um, this is probably, I mean, most women I talk to today, this makes their skin crawl. The idea of submitting to somebody, particularly um, as the church submits to Christ and the husband is the head, this makes women say, I want to puke. And I don't blame you, right? Um, this sounds by itself sounds pretty horrific. Yet, Two things we need to make sure that we hear in context. What else was being circulated and said about marriage in the first century? Okay, so how does Paul stand out in relationship to his peers? And let's read the text in full context. Did you catch verse 21? Verse 21 says that, um, that husbands and wives are to submit to one another because they're both submitting to Christ. So as the husband submits to Christ, the wife submits to Christ, they then submit to each other. Paul gives this very detailed, specific um, address to women. Submit to your husbands, your husbands to head. But Paul now is not going to leave husbands out. And this is where Paul stands out. Because other first century writers were absolutely talking about how wives and women should be submissive and silent and be the best possible um, to their husbands. And there are plenty of texts in the first century that tell women even how to become the best possible women for their husbands. Plenty of texts that tell children how to be the best for their parents. But Paul is the only one who's telling husbands how to mind themselves. And here's what Paul says in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present to her or present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Um, 
In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, because he who loves his wife loves himself. And after all, no one has ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. We're all members of this body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect, um, must respect her husband. So in this, Paul challenges us, Paul challenges husbands to love their wives just as Christ loved the church, meaning husbands die for your wives. Just to take care of your body, take care of your wife. So in this text, Paul tells wives, respect and submit. Paul tells husbands, submit and die for your wives. So actually, husbands have the greater challenge. But so often, people only read part of this document. And this is where we see religious fueling of domestic violence, patriarchy, male domination, sexual abuse, just ridiculous things. This is not read in full context. Finally, Paul finishes his uh, discussion on Ephesians by encouraging people to take on the full armor of God because there's this spiritual war that's going around. The devil is seeking to destroy. So people are to put on the spiritual armor, not the physical armor. Again, so think about nonviolence. Think about the challenge to the Roman military. Think about the, the Christian challenge to the Roman Empire. So now take the images, but do it differently. And here are the weapons Paul says that we should battle with. The first one is the belt of truth. The, the breastplate of righteousness, shoes that are armored and ready for the gospel of peace, a shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And Paul says, pray always, pray in the spirit. Um, and he says at the end of his text that as you pray, you should pray also for him, um, because here's what he says in verse 19. This is chapter 6, verse 19. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, the words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So Paul says, even as I'm in prison, I'm an ambassador. Right now, I'm an ambassador in chains. I'm an ambassador for Christ. So pray for me that I will never shrink back and I will speak the truth. Um, so this is Ephesians. And we've already talked about Galatians. So uh, this is Ephesians. Any questions, let me know.